the second day I was on the job, and uh, it was an interesting, interesting time period that uh, that he was able to. Many people never thought President Trump could change his mind, but he changed his mind that day. And I think American agriculture, hopefully Canadian and Mexican agriculture, are all feel relieved that it didn't happen that way. Hi, everyone. It is my honor to welcome you to season two of Fireside Chats with Aaron. I'm your host, Aaron Gowerluck. I want to start off by saying thank you to everyone listening and watching for your support of our podcast. What started as a labor of love and a place for conversations with policymakers and industry influencers has evolved into a platform for big ideas and one of Canada's top agriculture policy podcasts. And for that, I'm very grateful. After a season filled with amazing guests, I'm sure you're wondering, how could we top that? Well, listeners, I'm proud to say I think we have. Today's episode features a conversation with a former farmer who has also served as the United States 31st Secretary of Agriculture and Governor of the state of Georgia. Secretary Perdue came by his knowledge of agriculture the old-fashioned way. He was born into a farming family in Bonaire, Georgia. From childhood and through his life in business and elected office, Secretary Perdue has experienced the industry from every possible perspective. He is uniquely qualified as a former farmer, agribusinessman, a veterinarian, state legislator, 81st Governor of Georgia, and more recently, the 31st United States Secretary of Agriculture. As the product of Georgia, a state where agriculture is the leading economic driver, Secretary Purdue recognizes that agriculture is an issue and industry which cuts across political party boundaries. He also recognizes that the scope, size, and diversity of America's agricultural sector requires reaching across the aisle so that partisanship doesn't get in the way of good solutions for American farmers, ranchers, and consumers. Secretary Purdue, thank you for stopping by for a fireside chat. We're happy to join you here today. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Excellent. You served as the Senator for Georgia from 1991 to 2002, and then Governor from 2003 to 2011. But on January 18th, 2017, President Donald Trump announced that he would nominate you to serve as the United States Secretary of Agriculture. Tell me about the day you got the call. Well, Aaron, there's a little humor that goes along with this because... uh, If you look at that date, I was really the last cabinet secretary to be announced. And uh, I think it was probably two days prior to inauguration day. And I think the president must have looked around at one of the dinners and said, I don't think we have a secretary of agriculture. Now, he called me and uh, in the really November, shortly after he was elected, I went to Trump Tower and had a, uh, a great interview there. And it literally was a job interview, uh, very dissimilar to what you would think of a political appointment, but it was, uh, here's what I'm hearing on the campaign about agriculture. Tell me what you think about that. Tell me what you would do. And really a discovery of the things that he'd been hearing about this. This is what I think we ought to do. What do you think about that? So we probably met for an hour there and uh, I really didn't think anything about it. I had not been a, a huge, strong supporter. I supported the President Trump after the, after the nomination, but I'd not been an early supporter and didn't have any really political creds that I thought would, would carry the day in those kind of appointments. So I'm rocked along really through December and I uh, heard very little, even in the January, there were various names the press had floated out for a number of, time, number of months there about who was on first and who was the, the favorite. And uh, as it turned out, there hadn't been an announcement. And so on January the 18th, uh, I was having dinner with my cousin who was a United States Senator and his wife at that time, as well as another couple. We were there at the restaurant. I had my phone on the table on silent turned up and a number appeared that I didn't recognize. And I had certainly not gonna interrupt that dinner with friends to have a phone call. And my cousin looked over and he said, that number sounds really, looks very, very familiar. I think you ought to answer that. And I answered it he said, uh, Sonny Perdue, I said, yes. He said, this is Donald Trump. He said, are you still interested in being the Secretary of Agriculture? I said, Mr. President, it would be an honor to serve as the Secretary of Agriculture. He said, good, you're in. And that's how it happened. (laughs) So uh, 
he, he's told the story since that time of many, many interviews that the staff brought him through. And I think they were at that, that point had chosen agriculture to look for a diversity candidate. And as you may know, in agriculture, we're not our strongest suit is not diversity uh, in either gender or race in that regard. And uh, he's made that comment a number of times, but uh, we, uh, we hit it off well. Excellent. What a day. And I, and I want to ask you about, about the process that you talked about, because it's very different here in Canada. You're appointed as a minister, and there you are. But you have, you're subject to a nomination process in the United States. Yes. And so I wanted to ask you about what it would have been like for you to go through that nomination process. And in, in your case, that would have been with the, uh, the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and, and Forestry. They would have to approve your nomination. What was that process like for you? It was very interesting, obviously. Uh, I love your parliamentary system, and I think the ministers there to elect in their own right and then become form the, the government there is a, is a great way to do that. Obviously, here in the Republic, in the United States, we have the, the three branches, the executive and the legislative, and the Congress is our legislative branch. Our Constitution requires that the executive branch gets to nominate there, and uh, they are served uh, at the confirmation of the body of the Senate uh, there that is represented in every state. So that, that's the whole purpose of that. So the Senate does have a lot to, and we see it from every, every administration there. The Biden administration has had similar nominations, some which sail through, some which have been uh, withdrawn in that regard. But it is, uh, it's really a deep dive into your history, your bio, and uh, the kind of questions that uh, people wanna know from their, uh, from their perspective of their states and in the, in, the, in, the, in the Committee on Agriculture there, they wanted to know what I thought about different things and, and uh, really those kind of things. It really was a, it was a good opportunity. We have uh, prior to that in practicing, we had what's called murder boards. And uh, obviously the opposing party uh, from the executive branch loves to uh, embarrass or show out the, the, the weaker side of the candidate or the nominee in that regard. And obviously the home team loves to support that by softball questions. So it was that kind of thing, but honestly, it was good to, good exercise. I had visited with most of the senators, all the senators on the committee, but I think I, I had visited with every United States Senator uh, that would uh, accept an appointment with me there to just to talk privately in their offices about who I was and my background. And so we tried to prepare very, Seriously, because I'm a big believer in the uh, the uh, three branches of government. The, the legislative branch has a, a very profound responsibility as does, does the executive branch. So even having come from governor, having been a state senator, I recognize both of the responsibilities there in the state and certainly from a federal perspective as well. And uh, so uh, I respected their authority and their uh, concurrence with the administrations there. So we had a good time. Most of it turned out to be, uh, even from the opposing party, will you come to our state and, uh, and, uh, and visit our farmers, that kind of thing. So it, it was a very successful uh, vote and uh, uh, not only in the committee, but in the Senate as a whole, I'm very grateful for that. Thank you for that. I know many of our, our, our industry partners here in the agriculture sector and, and farmers across the country listening, we're all political junkies. So we appreciate knowing a bit more about the process that went, in, went into your nomination and your appointment. So you're in the job about a year into uh, your tenure and the tenure of, of President Donald Trump. The president announces that he has plans to formally terminate NAFTA. How did you react to that announcement? Even now, Aaron, my heart's in my throat <laughs> when I heard that. But it really wasn't even a year. Uh, honestly, another uh, state of time was uh, uh, that it was the second day. It was the day after I had been confirmed when uh, I got called to the White House. I had an appointment that afternoon, and actually Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross had uh, called me on the phone and asked what would happen if we withdrew from NAFTA. And after I got through gasping and coughing, I said, uh, uh, Secretary, it would not be a good idea. He said, well, you need, to get to the, you need to get to the Oval Office quickly. So I ran on over, picked up a couple of maps that I'd heard of some thoughts about that, and uh, went in and uh, really it was uh, not extremely organized at that point. So I saw his security person that I'd known 
from the Trump Tower and said, I need to talk to the boss really badly. And he said, okay, opens the door. He says, Sonny needs to see you, Mr. President. And after about 10 minutes, I walked in, there were other people there and they were literally discussing uh, the executive order of withdrawing from NAFTA. And uh, I'd taken some maps with me that showed the, the president how well regarded, particularly by votes he had been in what's called the flyover district of America. That's the rural aspects. How many of those counties? It looked like a sea of red across the U.S. with some blue dots in the, in the metropolitan areas there uh, across the United States. I'm not sure he had seen that yet, but I showed him, Mr. President, I know you've heard in the manufacturing sector that NAFTA has not been good for the American worker, and I don't disagree with that. Obviously, we've seen a lot of jobs go to Mexico across the southern border, but uh, from an agricultural perspective, uh, it has been good for agriculture, not just in the United States, but good in Canada and our neighbors to the south as well in Mexico. So I would love to ask you to reconsider and give us an opportunity to work out a better agreement that would be uh, more to your liking and I think a, a more sustainable agreement in trade between North America. We are, I think I learned this from uh, Lawrence McCauley actually, we are, we are in a very pristine area of the world with the North America with the attributes of Canada and the United States and Mexico there. And we're kind of a garden spot in my opinion from an from a agricultural perspective. So he said, okay, even though I drafted this and I edited this uh, executive order myself, uh, you and Ambassador Lighthizer better get on it and get it right very quickly. So uh, he relented at that point and uh, announced that we would be uh, negotiating another uh, trilateral uh, uh, trade, associate, trade agreement. And that's where you got USMCA. So that was the second day I was on the job. And uh, it was an interesting, interesting time period that, uh, that he was able to, many people never thought President Trump could change his mind, but he changed his mind that day. And I think American agriculture, hopefully Canadian and Mexican agriculture are all feel relieved that it didn't happen that way at that point in time. I think the sudden withdrawal would have thrown all of our, our three countries in the agricultural sector into turmoil regarding trade. And, and for that, we are very grateful. Uh, the United States being our most important trading partner, I think we all reacted in a similar way that you did. And so thank you um, for, for creating that space to renegotiate the new agreement. And I want to ask you about, about that agreement um, and your involvement in the renegotiation of the deal that would replace NAFTA, the, the USMCA, I think we call it Kuzma here in Canada. But you mentioned working closely with your Canadian counterpart at the time, uh, Agriculture Minister Lawrence McCauley. Tell me about what it was like to work with Minister McCauley through this process, because I understand that the two of you got along quite well. We did get along quite well. It was like uh, also reacquainting with an old friend. We had similar backgrounds, obviously. He was an authentic uh, farmer from Prince Edward Island, and uh, Mary and I had the quite, quite the joy of visiting in his home with uh, Minister McCauley and Francis, his wife, and just uh, it was if we had known one another all of our lives. He was very respectful, but also very uh, uh, a huge advocate for the Canadian perspective on agriculture and what their needs were. And I, uh, I respected that. Uh, he and I did not have the primary responsibilities, you may know. Our US Trade Ambassador, Robert Lighthizer, and your Minister of Commerce and uh, Economy um, had the primary responsibility for the detailed negotiations of that. But um, Minister McCauley and I had a lot of influence, particularly from the ag sector of the new trade agreement in that regard. And I know uh, Ambassador Lighthizer and I worked very, very strongly as uh, Minister McCauley did with his own team as well over the, you know, you remember the really the contentious issue was a lot of the dairy, uh, dairy perspective in that way. But I think overall, we came out with a a good, uh, a good agreement, whether you call it USMCA or Kuzma, or, uh, that way, uh, in that way to benefit uh, uh, really all three of our nations, not just the ag sector, but all three of our nations. Uh, uh, we are in a usual garden spot of the world here in North America, and the, the production capability we have among, among the three of us is, uh, is, is incredible, and we wanted to preserve that. I know 
like any trade agreement, Aaron, none of the three countries got everything they wanted. And, uh, and that's, that's probably the, the best definition of a good trade agreement in that regard. So uh, I'm very proud that it worked out. I'm very proud of the president gave us the time to, uh, to do that and then sign the agreement. And then the, your, your leadership of your nation, as well as uh, the leadership of the president worked very hard to get it ratified by, our, by the parliament and by, by our bodies. So we're very grateful for that. I think, I think it is the, the type of agreement that uh, really lends itself to the, to the future. It contains some uh, more modern technological issues that uh, we'd never thought about 25 years ago in that regard. But I think it addressed some of those things it will good, be a good platform going forward uh, in, in continuing these, uh, these trade agreements. The relationship between Canada and uh, we, we, we really just consider Canadians, I mean, I do, our, our, our cousins to the north and the Mexicans, cousins to the south. And we, we have a wonderful relationship and a wonderful opportunity here in North America to, uh, to really perpetuate that. A lot ongoing in that regard, and I hope we'll I hope we'll do that. I hope everyone will value that going forward. Thank you. I I, I want to ask you more about that technology and that innovation here in a moment. But maybe first, one last question on the agreement itself. Do you think there's ever going to be another agreement like this? Well, after this one expires, is is this the end in your view of this all encompassing trade agreement or? Are we going to expect a movement in your view to these smaller bilaterals or sector by sector agreements? Well, I certainly hope the unique relationship we have among the North American countries, Mexico, Canada, and the United States, uh, calls for, I believe, a long standing uh, trade relationship. And uh, I, I hope that we don't parcel it out into a sector by sector or uh, uh, bilateral relationships that way. I think the relationship that, tra that uh, transition, transitions all three countries is, is really uh, imperative that we continue. Now, will it last 25 years with modern technology and other things that way? Uh, I'd love to see us uh, uh, continue to improve uh, those things. These, uh, it probably needs to be looked at on an ongoing basis, not from the not from the cliff, falling off the cliff of withdrawing, but uh, certainly from modernizing it as new technologies, new cropping systems and, and new products come about. I hope that we can continue. I think it's extremely important for all three countries in the, in the ag sectors, but also the citizens who benefit from the, uh, the trade among the three. Thank you. One final question for you on trade now from uh, from an international perspective, if I may, but uh, I think there's acknowledgement now that, that the world needs to reform uh, the or modernize the World Trade Organization, although there are clearly disagreements, perhaps in terms of how we're going to get there. As you know, Canada has been leading the Ottawa Group on WTO reform, which the United States is not a part of. As a large exporter, but a small population, Canada relies ba on rules-based trade for our prosperity. I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how nations can come together to ensure continued free and fair trade with a functioning WTO. Well, I appreciate Canada's effort in reforming the WTO. It was a, always a source of irritation with the president. And uh, we felt like that uh, it didn't really reflect, reflect the scale uh, that that was present in the World Trade Organization regarding where the votes were versus where the predominance of trade actually took place. So we'd love to see some reform in that way that would make it uh, operate in a much more balanced uh, perspective from that, uh, from that, uh, um, from that area. Uh, I think, again, uh, it's needed uh, to be reformed, and I hope that all of us can come together with something that I I, I do encourage Canada to stay at that and uh, make recommendations. I think Canada is in a unique perspective, uh, being maybe a smaller population, but agriculture is important. But honestly, Aaron, it's important in the United States as well. And, and for that, both nations are blessed where we are essentially uh, food independent in that regard. And uh, we don't have to depend on other countries for our food supply. Our producers in the United States can produce more than they can, and our domestic uh, consumers can consume. Therefore, trade is 
just as important in the United States, it really is, it is in Canada, even with a smaller population and, and great production. So trade is, is really the essence. I'm a big believer that trade properly done can be a huge uh, a goodwill measure for international peace and tranquility as well as we become interdependent upon one another. And I think the interdependence that we have between our three countries is uh, extremely important. Thank you. I, I want to use this opportunity maybe to segue to a conversation with you on sustainability. This is an increasingly important topic, and it, it certainly has trade implications for both countries. You know, Canadian and American farmers share similar goals with respect to sustainability on their farming operations, as well as you mentioned, a shared reliance on international trade for the success of their of their operations. How can our countries, Canada and the U.S., as well as other like-minded nations around the world, better collaborate to ensure that we meet our climate change goals, we protect free trade, but we, can, we work to continue to ensure that we have access to the agriculture innovation that you talked about? Well, that's a challenge, obviously, and uh, you may know some of my um, positions over the European uh, farm to fork uh, effort. It is really would be a catastrophic, in my opinion, for European agriculture, uh, whereby they would become really more independent. Look, all farmers, in my opinion, if you look at the statistics, and we use many factual statistics in the United States about how much more we were doing with how much less today than we were uh, 75 years ago, 50 years ago, I think, again, the, those that don't like modern agricultural techniques try to persuade the public that we are raping the land, which is absolutely not true. It is uh, very efficient. If you take, uh, you have to go back to all organic farming, first of all, we would not be able to feed our populations in any of our countries to the degree that they are currently nourished now. And yet it would take much more land and actually much more inputs there that would not be uh, helpful. I think the European policy got captured over political ideology more than scientific facts about agricultural production. And that's unfortunate. Uh, obviously with COVID, we've talked about let's follow the science. We need to follow the science in agriculture and face the facts that modern agricultural production around the world, but particularly in North America, is providing the most nutritious, the safest, the most efficient food supply that this world's ever known. And we all are beneficiaries of it. If we go to the grocery store, our biggest uh, challenge is choice uh, there. I mean, I, I don't go to the grocery store very often. My wife does most of the shopping. When I go, I have to get on FaceTime and say this one or this one or this one because there's so many choices that we have. Now, during the COVID, obviously, we... Uh, we panicked a little bit when we saw some bare shelves over choices that we've been accustomed to. But that's simply an example of how we have become so blessed and so affluent in food supply and nourishment in the, in the world today, but particularly in, the, in our countries here, that uh, it would be a tragedy for us to try to blow up this system over ideological goals. I think our farmers are making great progress over climate change with tools that are available to them, with cover crops and with uh, no-till farming and, and carbon capture. We were beginning a study over really measuring the carbon capture in, in our fields and lands there of how much they were literally contributing in production agriculture, not just in forestry, which we know Canada is blessed with, carbon capture and its huge forests, but also in the United States, we're more forested than we were in the 1920s and 1930s. So we have the carbon capture there. And I believe, unfortunately, agriculture has been blamed for some of the things, both in production agriculture and animal agriculture, for which they've been uh, givers and not takers. And, and that was my next question for you, was, was, was largely around the European Union and the, and the farm to fork strategy. So I, I appreciate you sharing your perspectives on that. But in contrast, in terms of what we can do, I think, to rally together with like-minded countries, the United States is leading this coalition now. The, I don't know to what extent you're familiar with the U.S. Sustainable Productivity Growth Coalition. And if you could talk maybe a bit more about how this coalition has emerged, as well as your views on, on innovation and, 
and what you think this coalition will be capable of. Canada is not yet a member of this coalition. We hope that it will be. But talk a bit about the role for coalitions like this. Well, none of us are on an island. We're on the same planet with the same challenges. And uh, frankly, the more that we can build coalitions of like-minded people that use technology, the better off we'll be. Uh, we felt like it would be a travesty for European citizens, but particularly the agricultural sector, to go down the route they were going with the farm before. So the technology for agriculture has been amazing. Aaron, I grew up as a, on a diversified row crop farm in Georgia. I know the things we were doing uh, 60, 70 years ago that way, and I know how we're, we're doing today. The productivity increases have been absolutely phenomenal, probably as much as any type of manufacturing. It really equalizes the, the, the efficiency of the computer chip in, uh, in agricultural technology production in that way. I, I had many of those statistics when I was at USDA and we use those facts, but with people really seriously want to go and look at the, uh, the technology advances in agriculture, just what precision agriculture is doing, literally being able to use inputs of, of 50 to 30 uh, percent of what they were using before and, and doing 120 to 50 percent increase in, the, in yields. That's the, that's the story of, of uh, agriculture in North America, and we ought to celebrate that. We ought to want more of that. These coalitions will help, and I certainly hope that Canada, who is like-minded in, in those beliefs of being able to use the modern-day tools in that way, will join the coalition because it's going to take many of us. There are very, very active forces uh, against those common-sense type of principles around the world, and uh, we need uh, like-minded people that know how to produce good food, fiber, safe, healthy, nutritious to, to join together. I couldn't agree more. I, I hope that is the outcome here. And I've, I've got two final questions for you if, if you've got time for them. I want to get your reaction to the role for government in all of this, because you talk about the need to form these coalitions to be a champion for these ideas. What role do governments play, and I'm going to ask you to draw from some of your own personal experience here, in defending the important role that science plays in the advancement of modern agriculture practices when facing some of this activist pressure that you talk about? Because we can point to examples here in Canada very recently where Canadian farmers felt that there was political intervention in a science-based process. And I want to know from your perspective what you think governments ought to be doing when you're facing this increasing pressure. You're seeing it in the, in the European Union. You've talked about how the governments there are responding. How do you think North American governments should be responding to some of this increasing activist pressure? Well, governments has two roles. Obviously, obviously, as the ultimate regulator, governments have to ensure that what we're doing in technology is, first of all, safe, it's nutritious, it's healthy, it's for the benefit of society. So that's a fundamental role of government from a regulatory perspective. But in taking an ideological position of uh, of being anti-science or anti-technology from food production, we need to be on the side of efficiency and effectiveness. We are in most other industries in that way, and we need to celebrate and rejoice in, in new technologies or new inventions that can literally uh, help us to produce food. Food is vital. Agriculture is a noble cause uh, uh, industry, and uh, we need to be proud of that. We need to be proud that of Canada and the United States and Mexico can provide for their people in a way that uh, that nourishes them in a in, in a in a bread of life way. And so, as governments, we need to celebrate that. At USDA, we were de defending that role against people who I believe were sincere but sincerely misinformed about uh, American agriculture and. Uh, the, the media loves some of these stories there. We know that animal agriculture is under attack. And uh, I don't begrudge people becoming vegetarians if that's what they want to do. But I don't think they should begrudge other people who enjoy uh, animal-based protein at all. So let's make freedom of choice. That's what North America has been about. Let's have freedom of choice as long as the government is doing its job, making sure that we're doing all these things in a safe, healthy, the wholesome type of way that uh, uh, 
that gives our citizenry the opportunity of choice and the opportunity to make the choices that they would in their own life or their own families and have those choices. I think that's what Canadian United States agriculture has done. We've given people immense choices that my father and grandfather and, and uh, ancestors never had. Finally, I'd like to ask you, when you reflect on your, your tenure as a Secretary of Agriculture, what would you point to as being one of your greatest accomplishments? What are you most proud of? Well, you know, I served an administration that empowered the United States Department of Agriculture, irrespective of what people think about President Trump. He had a genuine affection and affinity for people of the land. I think he, in, in farmers and ranchers and people who, who produce things, I think he, he embodied that American spirit and the, and the, and the, and the Canadian spirit of, of entrepreneurship, risk-taking, hard work, value, ethics, and all those things that uh, you, you can't trick the law of agriculture. You, you, can't, you can't plant in September and harvest in October. Uh, there's a there's a cycle of life that has to be abided by, and he intuitively understood that. So I think again the uh, the aspect of uh, that I'm proud of is that we were empowered to uh, assist and help American agriculture. I was able to visit all 50 states as, as well as our uh, on Canada and other provinces and Prince Edward Island and others, and as well as Mexico. And we invited those ministers of agriculture here, but I'm proud of the relationship that we had to understood that we are in a very noble sector. It can be more noble than growing food and fiber and even energy for mankind in that regard, and humankind in that regard, that, uh, that I think we need more of, not less of. And it's unfortunate that many people, because of our influence, uh, affluence rather than the uh, we've become to doubt that. I, uh, I use the proverb oftentimes, and I do, I'll, I'll finish up with this. It says, when man has not enough to eat, he has one problem. When he has enough to eat, he has many problems. We've created many problems among ourselves in society because we are so affluent in our food production and all the quality of life issues that we are blessed to be in this part of the world. Not everyone lives in that kind of uh, Garden of Eden around this world. As a fine note on which to end this conversation, I want to thank you. This has really truly been a, a privilege and an honor to host you on our podcast, Secretary Purdue. Well, thank you. I look forward to being uh, in February with the grain growers in, in Canada. And thank you everyone for listening to another episode of Fireside Chats with Aaron. We'll be back in a few weeks time with another special guest. In the meantime, if you want to stay up to date with all things GGC, please follow us on Twitter at Grain Growers or on Instagram at Canada's Grain Growers. Until then. <music>